Welcome to the Impact Multiplier CEO podcast. If you're a chief executive or if you think like one and you want to create exponentially greater impact, then this show is for you. My name is Richard Medcalf, founder of X Quadrant. I coach some of the most successful and impressive CEOs and executive teams on the planet and help them achieve even more extraordinary results. Because no matter how successful you've been in the past, there's always a whole new level of impact available to you. So, if you're ready to play a bigger game than ever before, I invite you to join us and become an Impact Multiplier CEO. Today I speak with Adrian Weiler, who is the Chair of Smart Freight Centre. Before that, Adrian had 35 years in tenure at Inform, a software company uh, headquartered in Germany that works globally uh, on artificial intelligence-based decision-making for large corporates. So this is a really interesting conversation because we get into what drives Adrian, what drove him originally to, to take on a business that had been in operation for 16 years and that hadn't really grown and helped him turn that into a really successful and large global business. What, dri- what drove him to stay in that role for 35 years and what keeps him today going as he takes on a whole new challenge around the issue of climate repair. So this is really great because Adrian plays the long game and you'll see that in the conversation it comes out, of uh, his principles, his way of thinking. I think actually if you listen in to the logic behind what he's saying, you'll find he doesn't focus on tactics, he focuses on the real principles that have allowed him to build something that's sustainable uh, and that's impactful. So Adrian's got a lot of experience. I hope you benefit from this discussion with him in the next few minutes. Hi, Adrian, and welcome. Welcome, Richard. Nice for having me. Hey, it's going to be a, a fun conversation. You've got an extraordinary career. You spent 35 years as the chief executive of a business, which is incredible. And then <laughs> when, you, uh, when you kind of handed over the reins um, to one of our previous guests on the show, indeed, you then didn't just decide to uh, hang up your computer and uh, sit on a desert island sipping pina coladas for, for the rest of your retirement. You, you found a new mission, which is possibly even more thrilling by the sound of it in some ways, um, around the environment change uh, and, 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 and working on that. And so you've got a really fascinating stuff, you know, the you, it's real executive role for many, many years. And now this real other passion, which I know is something that you're extremely committed to. So I'm looking forward today and diving in and finding out really what makes you tick and what that story is. Yeah. Well, as I said, thank you for having me. And um, you rightfully explained that uh, there is uh, not just one mission in my life, but there is multiple missions. And right now I'm very much concentrating on um, what's called climate rescue, what might be called climate rescue. Mm. But prior to that, for the first, for the, for the previous 35 years, um, my, my passion was really with um, something entirely different, which is called digital decision-making. Mm. And digital decision-making is uh, IT systems algorithms, artificial intelligence, operations research, machine learning, fuzzy logic, mathematical Mm. optimization, uh, leveraged to improve the world, Mm. uh, basically to improve the business world, to to improve decision-making, planning, and real-time control of business operations. And that's really what Inform is about. And that was my passion for the past 35 years before I handed over my CEO position to a group of four people who are now co-CEOing the company in form. Yeah, perfect. So, and in fact, we, we spoke with Matthias um, a couple of seasons back, who was the person who recommended that we speak with you. So it was fascinating to understand how that co-CEO thing is playing out. Yeah. So, so today, I mean, let's kind of go back because what I understand is, is Inform as a business was already in existence for 16 years uh, and they already had five CEOs and really the company hadn't grown uh, at that point. And then you took over the reins, 
um, and you stayed there for 35 years, right? And, and, and really and really grew it. So just tell us a little bit, first of all, about what was the story there? And what, so first of all, kind of what changed perhaps when you came in, what kind of things did you do to take this very small business that obviously been successful, it hadn't died, right? It'd been profitable or whatever for 16 years, but you really took it into growth. So what happened there? And then perhaps we can also talk about uh, what kept you going and going and going and going for almost four decades. Well, what kept me going to to make it uh, to make it short is that, of course, I didn't do the same thing during all these thirty five years. I started out with a very small startup company and basically had to do everything. I was not a CEO of a large organization, so I couldn't deploy people, and rather, I had to do a lot of things, including coding, IT coding, software coding myself. But uh, let's come back to where I'm coming from. Before, um, before I joined Inform, I worked for a large uh, corporation, a very well-known international uh, group in Germany. And after that, I went to Australia. And I experienced some, some time in Australia and how the mates down there, the mateship culture of Australia works. And coming back to, uh, to Germany, I decided that, uh, well, I wanted to work for a company who had this kind of mateship culture that I had experienced in Australia. So that was basically where I, where I was coming from. And my, I was always looking to build such a company. And when I joined Inform, um, the, the other passion I always had was artificial intelligence. And in, uh, before at, at this other corporation in Germany and, and after that, I um, designed uh, some algorithms myself, some AI algorithms optimizing certain business operations. And I was passionate about applying operations research and artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning to uh, real world problems, mm. real world issues that large corporations had. So Inform at the time seemed to me a perfect candidate of, the, <laughs> of um, basically joining those two passions and make a living of it. And that, that's when I, when I became not just CEO, but I basically, um, uh, I became part owner of the company at the time. I bought out the original founder and, um, and started to grow the business from there. And so it sounds the like reason had, why, yeah. So it sounds, like, it sounds like there was this sense of, you had a sense of the culture you wanted to create. Exactly. And you had exactly. a sense of, the domain that you wanted to, you know, the, the area where you wanted to create value. So it wasn't just exactly. one, it wasn't just, I've got a great business idea, but also I have a sense for kind of business that I want to create. Yes. Around community or value, or... Client value, but at, at the same time, a happy workplace. Basically mm -hmm. workplace value for the employees and for the people I worked with. At the very beginning with only five people, you knew them very intimately and you worked intimately with them as a team. Mm. And so as we grow larger, and today we are, we are close to a thousand employees, <laughs> growing, of course, this personal interaction got a little bit more loose, but uh, I still um, consider many of the employees of, of my company as, as my friends. And I was, I was anxious to provide them with a way of professional life, which is worth living. I mean, after all, we are spending eight, eight hours every day on yeah. average in, in our business. So we better make it a good make it eight fun. hours rather than one, rather than uh, tire someone. Yeah, absolutely. So, so tell me for a bit more. So what did you start to do to grow the business? So, um, and, and it has to always give a sense of like, what was the growth of this business? We're talking about it growing. How much did it grow uh, over this period? And what would you say, what are the shifts that you made that perhaps those previous five CEOs didn't? Um, as a matter of fact, I, I employed some principles and those principles have been um, written up by Professor Zara Zarashwati, who is at the Darden Business School of Virginia in the United States. Uh, but she, she wrote the, the decisive paper in the early 2000s, I think in 2001 or 2002. And um, there is a textbook dating back to 2008 so I was applying these principles a lot, a lot longer and quite, quite some time before she wrote that book. But that book summarizes very well what those principles are. Mm. 
And those, but I don't want to, to go too much into detail here because we've got only half an hour, but uh, the, the principles of effectuation, um, many of those principles have to do with who you are, what you want, what you can achieve, and how you form a network of likewise people mm. who are self-selected, self-selected stakeholders in your business. And a self-selected stakeholder in the business is either an employee or it might be an investor, or it might be, and certainly is, the client. Mm. And so for Inform, it was always very, very important that we did our utmost to satisfy the client, to have happy clients. And today, we are looking at around two-thirds of our business being done with repeat customers. With companies like Mercedes-Benz, like Daimler, like like, um, BMW, like... uh, uh, British Airways, like American Airlines, United Airlines, and other very well-known worldwide companies that doing that are doing business with us for year, for decades, and they're very loyal to Inform, and we are very loyal to those customers. Yeah, and you so, can't do that when you're when you're out there for for a quick buck. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I, I get that long-term perspective that you built in. W- was there a moment? But was there something you did, would you say, uh, specifically? Because I know effectuation is multiple principles and mm-hmm. they obviously were in play for a long time. But was there like a moment where you felt, okay, we've now shifted the company from this stable, small trajectory to a growth trajectory? You know, were there a couple of key decisions perhaps that you made early on to change the direction? No, it wasn't, it wasn't something like a eureka moment. It was more, um, it was more living according to those principles. It was basically creating culture. It was creating a certain um, corporate culture that I thought is kind of mimicking the, the corporate culture you'll find in a lot of Australian companies, mm. and where where people are are mates to each other and where they they don't don't bite their backs, mm. and where they where they they're focusing on uh, on the client, and there is a there's a lots of a lot of these these principles involved how to to lead such a company. And one of those principles is to step back as early as possible or as quickly as possible as a leader rather than micromanaging the business. This is what I've I've seen with a lot of other CEOs um, that we partnership uh, with Mm -hmm. or or other CEOs in other corporations that they they tend to micromanage the business. And and that's, that's very bad. There's yeah. a principle which is called um, um, subsidiarity. Subsidiarity means that you push decision, the decisions, the day-to-day decisions to the smallest level or to, a, to the lowest level in, your, in the organization where, where people are really on the front and they know what they're doing. And you stay away as long as you can and only if something goes wrong, you step in as a leader. Yes, yeah. So I love this. So it's really the fact that by putting these principles out, the thing started to move, right? And you put it's, the foundations mm-hmm. in is what I'm hearing. So let's, so let's jump forward. Mm-hmm. Um, so after 35 years, what was it that got you to make the switch? Was there a trigger that made you go, okay, now it's time to leave that chapter behind to some degree. I know you're still involved in the business in various ways and still have executive yeah. roles as well as non-exec roles, but you made a change. You stepped down as the, made, as the CEO. You brought on co-CEOs, and then, and then you also got involved with this next thing, right? Smart Freight Center. So, yes. what was the story between ending one chapter and also the story about beginning that other chapter? Well, first of all, you mentioned it yourself. You, I mean, thirty-five years uh, in the role of a CEO is a very, very long time. And uh, <laughs> I mean, there is for everything in life. There is there is a moment. And I think the moment was just right to hand over responsibility of the company, of running the company to my, my successors. And um, I know these people, these four people that are handed over the, uh, the responsibilities of CEO, uh, I know them for quite a long time. The youngest of them uh, since 2008, which is already 14 years. So, uh, so I, I, it wasn't an unknown entity. I was, I was handing over the, um, the business to... Uh, to to people I uh, respected and I know fairly well uh, that they could that they could run the company according to the same principles that they grew up with, so to speak, over the last 14, 16, 20 years. And so I'm quite confident that 
the company Inform will survive in its uh, in its mission and can fulfill its its mission to deploy artificial intelligence to to planning and real time control issues in in, in corporations but for the next 35 50 50 years whatever let, let me be provocative for a second uh, mm -hmm. if i may uh, just cuz it's fun right sure. uh, why did you obviously i will talk with matthias um, on his side of things but mm -hmm. What led you to kind of decide that nobody else could step into your shoes and you needed to have four people instead of one people to do what you've been doing for 35 years? I'm curious. I, I got the opportunity to learn about the business and to learn about being a CEO for, for 35 years. So I started out when I was very small and the company was very small. And of course, I had a lot of experience gathered that way. None of the other ones or I didn't feel that any single person would be uh, would be able to do it uh, on its own, and so it it was a lot better to assemble four of them, each one with its uh, with his or her or his uh, specific strength, and uh, focusing on certain aspects of the business of running the business, mm. um, well, where where they had their forte, right. Yeah, I, mean, I guess it makes sense, right? It's a lot bigger now than it was when you started, and uh, and it's, I guess it's still growing. So the, the responsibilities continue to work. Yeah, still out. growing at the same at the yeah. same rate uh, every year. Yeah. And um, meanwhile, we have we, we are doing business in, in forty countries around the world. Yeah, um, we, we we have employees coming from thirty five different thirty seven latest count different nations, and uh, more than a thousand customers, and. Um, well, it's it's quite quite a challenge to to have such an operation. Perfect. Well, let, let, let's switch over. So, what about this new chapter, Smart Freight? Tell me about that, and why did you why did you get involved with it, and and, and what's it all about? Um, Smart Freight Center is a uh, an international NGO, Amsterdam based, uh, which helps multinationals to reduce their carbon footprint by decarbonizing logistics and um, freight transportation. And I was, um, I was asked to, uh, to join the board um, three, four years ago. And in 2020, in December, 2020, I was elected chairman of the board. And that was a very turbulent time when in Smart Freight Center, lots of things happened, which required a lot of attention, management attention, uh, which is exactly what I, what I did uh, basically during last year, most of the time. Right. after handing over my responsibilities at Inform to my successors. Uh, Smart Trade Center helps to reduce the carbon footprint of multinationals, uh, firstly by measuring what that carbon footprint in logistics is. And this is scope three emissions, as you might know, carbon scope three emissions, very difficult to measure. And Smart Freight Center was successful in establishing a methodology, the so-called GLEC framework, GLEC, framework to do just that. And now we're transitioning the strategy of Smart Freight Center towards a more active saving role where we would like to, to have a bigger impact in actually reducing the carbon footprint in logistics and international supply chains. It's Richard here with just a quick interlude. If you're serious about multiplying your impact, I have a free resource that you won't want to miss. I've put together a short email course called Exponential Leadership Principles. In it, I set out how you can use the same strategies as some of the world's top leaders to get out of incremental progress and achieve breakthrough results. Be prepared to have your current thinking challenged and to learn some very new ways of leading. If you're interested in following along, simply sign up at xquadrant.com slash go slash exponential. And now back to the conversation. That's great. And so tell me about the mission that you're on at this point then within this, right? Because obviously it's, it's, a, it's, it's a worthy mission, right? It's environmental impact. It's all this stuff. Yeah. What's, uh, on the other hand, there's plenty of other causes you could have focused on. I mean, was it just something which happened to come your way? Someone rang you up, so you come on the board, you happen to 
No, 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 no. It's, it's, what it's, drives you to do this? No, no. It's it's certainly um, the the main reason is that I'm really, really concerned about uh, what's going on currently um, in the world. And there is, of course, a lot of um, of things that are challenges that require attention. But climate change is certainly one of the big um, the, the big challenges that humankind, if you like, faces. And so. Uh, that that was driving my decision to to do something in, mm. that, in that respect and and make it part of my my further life, and the fact that it's an NGO, a nonprofit organization, has a lot to do with, of course, uh, that I'm I'm no longer um, in need of dire in dire need of of pennies, um, and, and and I have I can afford the time to mm. to spend time on that mission. Besides, while saying that, I must say that also inform has a strategy currently a strategy of targeting sustainability issues with our software mm. and we as i said we we have this artificial intelligence systems and some of those are explicitly targeting climate change or climate rescue so to speak uh, by for example by by reducing the carbon footprint of um, dispatch vehicle of dispatching vehicle fleets for transportation Right. Or by um, smartly allocating resources or material or parts mm -hmm. to warehouses rather than shipping them around um, between mm -hmm. different warehouses, and, uh, which is um, wasteful in terms of fuel and energy. Yeah, of course. So wh what about within Smart Freight Center? What's the, what's the challenging part of it? Um, <laughs> you know, so what's... Yeah, what, what's the stretch? You know, is, is it about mobilizing an ecosystem? Is it getting organized things internally? Is it evangelizing the message? I'm just kind of wondering, you know, what, what you find within that is, is the most... No, the, the message, I, I think the message is very clear. And the companies we're working with, like companies like Nestle or Ikea or Hewlett Packard, they are, they are very well aware. There's about 100 companies working with Smart Freight Center at this right. point. And all of them being multinationals and all of them trying to use their influence um, for their logistics suppliers, their logistics service providers to, um, to decarbonize their, their operations. Uh, however, uh, while there is quite a lot of technological solutions uh, like electric cars, electric trucks, um, ways of, of uh, improving the, um, the aerodynamics of, of trucking, um, and, and others, while there's a lot of technologies that could be deployed, the, the economics are, are, diff are difficult. And what we are trying to do is finding appropriate business models so that um, third party logistics providers could afford deploying those technologies. I think this is the, the biggest challenge that we are seeing before those technologies might become widely available, mm. economics. Yeah. And that's, of course, to do with economics of scale. And that, that of course, has to do with building networks of, of like-minded uh, multinationals and, uh, and helping them to, um, uh, to exert their influence. So is that a big part of your role, actually trying to build those relationships? Is that part exactly. of Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So tell me a bit about that. Um, because I always say we never have enough influence because if we did, we'd have achieved our goals, right? So often there's an influence gap between what we can imagine and what we've achieved. And so, but you know, but obviously on the other hand, you know, you're making all these things happen. So I'm kind of curious, you know, or like what, perhaps what advice would you even give to people who are looking to build ecosystems, right? Who, people who are looking to forge partnerships, relationships, mm. make things happen in the world. I have several CEO clients myself who are like, you know, like we need to band together with other companies to make, because we can't solve these problems all by ourselves. So I'm curious as to how you would, you know, what, what you found has worked in your experience. I think uh, personal networks is quite important. And I think this is, um, if you look at um, social media and the impact of social media, I think it's widely over overrated, mm. um, particularly when it comes to CEOs, because um, I don't know that many CEOs that spend a lot of time on LinkedIn and, and other social platforms because, as you know, 
you know <laughs> it's uh, it's very very difficult to um, to control your own time and your own life when once you start um, being too much invested in social media so therefore um, the the main the main path towards impact is uh, personal relationships and those personal relationships of course you get through networking mm. And when you say networking, like, what would you do? What do you do? How would you build that personal network? How do you reinforce it? How do you expand it? There's, there's conferences and um, there, is, um, there is conferences where, where you meet people and, um, and where you get referrals. And the important part is the referral. So even people that are not at the conferences, uh, you, you get referred to and then they, they would listen to you rather than... Um, then listen to a broadcast message on 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 yeah. any social media platform. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to say that. I'm I'm, I'm yeah. right now. I'm I'm speaking on a social media platform. <laughs> sorry to speak, wow. but uh, but 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 it, you know. Well, so. no, it's it, it's a great point. Um, yeah. I mean, and I I see that as well, right? I mean, my business is pretty high end business. Mm -hmm. I work with very senior leaders, and a lot of that is from the personal network. You know, as you said. Yeah two-thirds of your business is referrals, whatever, or repeat business. I mean, I think mine's higher, right? Um, mm -hmm. Higher percentage because, um, and so it's important to figure out there's that crown jewels in the personal network and your own reputation and the way you serve people in that network. And then there's the other stuff, which I think can be good when you have a message you want to get out, when there's a broader reach, mm -hmm. but you have to be aware of what you're doing in each case. So... For example, for the podcast, the, one of the founding reasons for why I created the podcast was because there were stories that my clients, you know, what my clients were up to that yeah. were more valuable yeah. for a broader audience that perhaps I'm not going to yeah. get to work with one-to-one. -one. Yeah. And then after that, it broadened out. Well, what are the other stories that people might be interested in in, in connecting with and understanding? Uh, but I think you're right. There's a difference between, you know, depth. I mean, there's a kind of a scale of impact at a high level, and then there's a depth of impact that actually is probably where the magic is yeah that's that, that's the case that's certainly the case but from from my days at inform i certainly know that um, these uh, personal relationships to your clients are invaluable and um even if we if even if something goes wrong i mean sometimes i mean we our, our operations are quite mission critical uh, so the software we we deploy for example they're they're controlling the entire ground operations at the, the largest airports on earth, mm. like Atlanta Hartfield in, right. in, uh, in Georgia. Um, and we were quite instrumental in, in reducing the departure delays by 31%, according to what the uh, New York Times has written about it a year later. Uh, however, uh, with that mission criticality comes the, the responsibility of uh, nothing can go wrong. And of course, things go wrong with your software from time to time because uh, there is so many factors out there that you can't control all the time. And then it's very important that you have a close relationship to um, to your to your to your customers, and you have to maintain that at all times yes. um, to to mitigate the effect if something happens. I mean, if you, if you look at the fact that we are there, there's about three and a half million containers moved through. Germany's largest container tumble. Um, we decide on each and every movement of each and every of those containers with our software, mm -hmm. the sequence in which they're moved, by what resources they're moved, at what point in time, at what location. And you can imagine that this is awfully complex and, and there, there is things that go wrong and there, went, there, there were things that went wrong. And, um, so it was, it was quite okay, or it was quite helpful to um, then speak to the corporate management in Hamburg and um, apologize <laughs> and still, still be on good relations with them. That, that was, I'm, I'm, I'm talking now about an incident that occurred about seven, eight years ago. Right. Yeah. Thank you for that. That's, um, yeah, it's a good story of, well, Nothing beats that genuine relationship, right? General, with, genuine with relationships. A, yeah. Yeah. Specific, specifically when you're in a mission critical business. 
Yes. So let's kind of head over to some of our quick fire questions that I like to ask our guests. Uh, the first is what's a favorite quote? What's something that kind of you live by or you always telling your people? Um, I actually, there isn't, there isn't such a quote because I'm very bad at remembering quotes. Um, however, there is a, a principle and that's trust. Mm. Trust versus control. And um, I value trust a lot more than control, even if it means that from time to time, your um, people are not doing the right thing. Still, trust is the main the main word. I would uh, I would build an empire on. Yeah, lovely. What about a book? Is there a book that's really influenced you um, over the years? Yeah, obviously, Frederick Laloux, mm -hmm. uh, reinventing organizations. Um, and the other, it's not a book, it's a complete series of books. He wrote several books. Uh, it's a, um, a philosopher called uh, Reinhard Sprenger. Reinhard Sprenger, it's a German, German language um, guy who spoke about, writes extensively about in, intrinsic motivation and uh, how intrinsic motivation can be fostered and uh, can be nurtured through corporate culture. Mm. That's great, actually, because... So often people try to focus on the extrinsic motivational factors. Ah, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the carrot and the stick rather than yeah. autonomy, mastery, purpose, connection, these kind of things, right? Which no, 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 no. Nobody, nobody works for money. I mean, I mean we, we pay quite quite well, but, but at Inform, yeah. nobody works uh, purely for money. We, we work for, for a, certain, a certain purpose and mission. Absolutely. What advice would you give your 20-year-old self? Quite honestly, I thought a lot about that. And quite honestly, I don't know whether I would have done anything different. And um, I was lucky in many ways. Uh, I was lucky in working for that large German corporation mm. where I uh, got exposed very early, even while I was a student, to the corporate culture of uh, large corporations, mm. uh, multinationals, and then have the... And then when going to Australia and, and seeing how things can be done differently. And um, so I don't think I would do anything different. Well, I'm because still going to pull out a principle there, I think, which is a really helpful one in terms of advice mm -hmm. for others, which is get that exposure early, get different things, different cultures. Oh, yeah, of course. Of course. Because then that allows you to find your, your groove, your niche. Oh, of course. It's helpful. I was while, while I was while I was a student, I worked for um, an organization which is called ISEC, the mm -hmm. International Student Exchange uh, Organization, which um, organizes internships in large right. corporations. I did a couple of internships while I was a student, and I organized a lot of internships for others, and that uh, brought me quite a lot of exposure, uh, even as a student. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, yeah, another, another great example of exposure and, and trying different yeah. things out. Here's a good question, because it applies to you, right? Many of our best guests on the show come from referrals. And indeed, yeah, as you said, you, that's how I reached out to you originally, um, because of speaking with Matthias, which was, which was a great conversation. So I'm always curious, you know, is there an impactful CEO that you know, um, who you think would be a great guest, somebody who inspires you, um, or who's in, impacted you in your own journey? Uh, yeah, there is, in fact, there is actually two of them. Um, well, they, they're called uh, Mark Poppenbach and uh, Lars Former, Professor Lars Former. They're Germans, and they are, um, they had a consultancy, which is um, called Intrinsify. And Intrinsify, the name of the corporation already says what it does. It consults companies in how to, um, to value intrinsic motivation and how to, um, motivate people in an intrinsic mm. way. Ah, fascinating. Yeah. And, and, and what do you admire about them? Like what, what, what's, what inspires you about that or about them? They're, 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 they, they, they're very well representing um, the principles of purpose-driven companies. And which, if you look at today's um, talent and workforce, the biggest challenge that we're all seeing in many industries and certainly in the IT industry as well is finding talent yeah. and not just finding anybody, but finding the right talent, finding people who are motivated to um, think as an entrepreneur. Yeah. And this entrepreneurial thinking 
um, requires a culture, a corporate culture, which nurtures that kind of entrepreneurial thinking. And this entrepreneurship thinking is exactly what Intrinsify, this particular uh-huh. company, is is helping helping mm-hmm. corporations to um, to achieve. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, and they're, they're walking their talk by the sound of it. Yeah. So, so finally, Adrian, what's where do you go from here, right? How do you continue to multiply your impact? Because I, I'm a believer that you know you might have retired from your corp, you know your 35 years and everything else, but there's still more impact ahead of you. And I'm wondering what might you have to even shift in yourself to see that. Well, uh, yeah. Well, right now, obviously, we we have a we have a big shift in strategy coming up at Smart Freight Center, and I'm part of that. Uh, but uh, the the other the other portion of your question is what is where is Inform the company Inform, which is still my company, right? Going from here, despite the fact that I'm not leading it as a CEO anymore. Yeah. And um, what we what we did over the past 35 years was we st- I started out with just a single business division. Now we are having um, nine business business divisions out there and about 20 different products, what we call product solutions, artificial intelligence solutions for various types of industries. And what we, what we intend to do with Inform is expand that, like finding new issues or new um, business problems, business uh, fields where to deploy artificial intelligence in order to make the businesses more efficient, more reliable, uh, more resilient in the face of unexpected changes and volatility, which is uh, currently plaguing the world. Oh, I don't, and I don't also, think there's any volatility these days. I think we're all pretty calm in the world. No, no, well, no volatility <laughs> at all. It's all plain and, and, and also, and also, in terms of in terms of sustainability and sustain, sustainability with regards to climate, but also with regards to social responsibility uh, towards their own employees and towards basically making the world a better place. Sorry to say, it sounds maybe, it sounds too, um, too optimistic, but I'm an optimist. Well, I, I think you have been optimistic. I think most business owners, founders, CEOs, actually, yeah, there's a few people, as I've said before, it's uh, Jeff Bezos who uh, has said, you know, there are missionaries and there are mercenaries. And actually, yeah, the mercenaries just want to flip their stock, and the, and the mercenaries actually want to make the world. But the missionaries want to make the world a better place. Yeah. And he says actually, the missionaries tend to make more money anyway along the way yeah. because they're actually in the on, long way. Yeah. yeah. You know, and so, yeah, I found yeah, my clients, you know, life is short, you know, and we we have a chance to make an impact. And I think actually, people start to realize, you know what, I'm yeah. going to put, to put bread on the table. Let me actually make the world a better place. I, I think it, yeah, it sounds, yeah, we're going to make the world a better place. It sounds a bit idealistic, but that's what we need, right? As humans, we need people who are going to be positive and, and do that. So Actually, I admire your, your podcast for that. And I respect what you are doing, your work very well, because I do think you are making quite a difference. And I understand there is uh, actually thousands of, of listeners to your podcast series. And by giving examples and by providing these type of interactions and interviews, I think you're you're having a very significant impact on the world of um, corporate leadership. And so I think, um, yeah, I, what you're doing there is mm-hmm. certainly also one of those missionary things um, I very much respect. And well, thank you. That's, that's nice. I have the tables turned on me like that. Thank you. Um, th- there was a... I can't remember whether it was a client of mine or a partner or somebody, mm-hmm. but they, they said, I want to help the good guys win. And I actually <laughs> love that as a phrase that stuck <laughs> with me because that's kind of my own mission is if I can help yeah. people who are up to, um, good, you know, want to make good things happen in the world, if I can help them multiply their impact, mm-hmm. reinvent yeah. their own success formula to make a bigger, more positive impact on yeah. their, on their yeah. purpose, their people, their profit then that's a self-reinforcing circle. And that's the, probably the biggest way that I can help do my yeah, best. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, Adrian, it's been great to talk to you. Uh, it's been great to kind of understand those two parts of, of what you're up to um, with Inform and with Smart Freight and, and just to kind of hear those principles, right? The trust, the 
laying the cultural foundations, the building relationships with customers in your network, uh, not just skimming over the surface, but playing the long game, which I think I've really heard in all sorts of ways, right? In establishing those cultural principles from the start, actually being doing the long game for 35 years, and then continuing to invest in people and relationships, that really comes out. And so thank you for, for sharing who you are really, um, as well as what you've done uh, in this discussion. Thank you for having me. So Adrian, if people want to find out any more about you, get in touch with you or Smart Freight or Inform, you know, what's the best way for them you to do that? You certainly, LinkedIn, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm very accessible on LinkedIn. And also uh, you might publish my uh, my email um, on, on Inform, which is adrian.viola at inform.viola.inform.software.com. Perfect. Well, hey, it's been great to speak. Thanks so much again. And look forward to hearing how all these uh, stories continue to evolve. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care, Adrian. Bye-bye. Take care. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Now let's talk about you. When you're in top leadership, when you're in the biggest role of your career, who supports you at a deep level as you lead others? Who helps you multiply your impact and get to the next level? If you're ready to learn more about our content, our coaching, and our community, then visit us at xquadrant.com.